So plan the prep, then do it. And these days we're planning with digital versus analog. I think there is a difference because with digital, if you can't visualize your margin, you can't scan it. So if you're going to be dropping margins in approximately or being aggressive around the gingiva, pay attention or start to think in your mind, how are you going to plan if you're only scanning? I don't think anyone should be doing only anything personally. I think there's a lot of case, scenario, uh, case dependent scenarios. But you still want to think about in your head before you touch that tooth with a burr, what's my end game here? How do I plan on impressing this tooth? Is it going to be a scan or is it going to be an analog? Burrs, Matt talked about this this morning. I think it's funny because everyone feels the same way. They want to know what you use, why you use it. We were talking about at lunch. I mean, I could use a lot of different burrs to accomplish the same things. And I have a very basic kit now. Um, and I do what Matt does. They're all pre-made, pre-sterilized, they're in kits. And so all I do is grab a burr block and, and do my crown preps. Don't get me wrong, do I go to my drawer if I need something when I'm excavating? Of course, right? But this gives you a foundation and just like he said, you can take a picture and your team can set this up and it can be consistent and you can have five in every room and you don't have to be waiting around. It's about workflow. And trust me, my workflow gets stunted and stopped all day long anyway. But any time you can put a system in, it helps. Paul talks about that all the time. So these are basic burrs. Um, you know, uh, I use a barrel for my occlusal reduction. I'll show you more about that. And then these are what I break my interproximal contacts with typically posteriorly. I like the little flame at the end so I can you know, just kind of watch where my margin is and where I'm going to be. These are more gross reduction in different widths, depending on if I'm using a premolar or a big molar. And then you know, sort of a spare one that can be a little shorter or one that I have to, you know, people talk about short shank burrs a lot for people who have a hard time opening. You know how you make a short shank burr? You take your regular burr and you cut the edge off it and now you have a short shank burr. I don't know why they sell short shank burrs, but in the meantime, I do that all day long. If someone's in a second molar area and you can't fit your handpiece in and you're using a pedo handpiece and you just cut the edge off the burr. Make sure when it's in that it's locked in solid because when you take away that edge, it's not going to fit in as well. But that's the way you can manage it. You have to do some ninja dontics, as we, my buddies and I always say. We do ninja dontics sometimes. You work with what you have. These here are for polishing temporaries. Sometimes I use it to smooth off my preps, which we'll talk about. And then, and then these are two burrs that I wouldn't would live without now. And this spear turned me onto these. It's nothing extraordinary, but they're red stripe burrs. They're finishing burrs. So anytime I finish a crown prep, which I'll show you, I end with these just to smooth everything. It makes it really pretty. It's really nice. And the crowns go on a lot smoother. This, it's, it's a basic but important sort of step. So here's the occlusal view of that 29, the one that uh, this, um, this older woman uh, agreed upon. No big deal. It's a regular tooth, 29. We've all done it. So here's step one, occlusal depth cut. I think at Spear they talk about doing interproximal contacts first. I could be wrong. Personally, I do occlusal first. It just makes sense to me, and when I talked about it a couple weeks ago, um, you know, you get the depth cut because you have a starting point. You want to burrow it, you want to bury it. Typically, if you're using full contour zirconiums, high translucency zirconiums, we can talk about materials. But two millimeters, you know, you want to go the whole burr, just, just get it in there. I mean, if you can't take this much off the tooth, you're going to be in trouble anyway. So you might as well just start from here and extrapolate out. So you do our depth cut. And then I take the, uh, so I, I skipped, I don't have a slide, unfortunately, of the, of the in-between, but after the depth cut, I'll take that barrel burr and I'll just take it on the occlusal table and I'll get as close to the adjacent teeth as I feel comfortable, but I'll get the rest of that occlusal table gone. And now when I go to do my reduced occlusal plane and break my contacts, there's not as much tooth structure there to have to manage. So you can see things a lot more clearly also. You're not dealing with like sort of that like rounded marginal ridge and then worrying about the contact. That's already sort of gone. If you look here, well, I don't have the whole thing, but if you would look here, this would be still contacting, but it wouldn't be as high as the adjacent tooth, so you can visualize things a lot easier. So bury the burr, break the occlusal table down, and then hit your contacts. You know, listen, Matt Costa, he made, up a, he made another great point, like, am I hitting adjacent teeth? I'm using loops with the light. Are you going to touch other teeth? 100%. And you know, it's always that question, do I want to take more of this tooth away and spare this one and, you know, be more aggressive here? Or am I willing to, like, have something that I have to polish when I'm done? Now, I say polish. I don't mean have to recontour or build up again or put a crown on this one because you've destroyed the mesial contact. So please, be conscientious, but don't feel like you can't touch an adjacent tooth, which is the reality of dentistry, 
and then come back at the end before you finish and polish it off and make sure everything's super smooth and, and, and taken care of. So that's what it looks like with my initial two cuts, occlusal and uh, interproximal reduction. And you can see it's not like it's an aggressive uh, texture here, but uh, it's definitely a little more roughened up. And then uh, buckle depth cut. So almost the same thing as the occlusal. I mean, you're not going to want to end up with a J shape margin here, and you have to be very careful about that. With the burr, with a round M chamfer, with a, which I'm using for everything now pretty much because of the materials, um, you can't end with this J shape finish line. It's not going to scan or impress well, and it won't finish well to a crown. So you're not burying the entire burr for this. You're burying it halfway, right? With the tip of that burr still being here so that you don't end up with this concavity underneath the margin. That won't scan or end well for a permanent crown. And then all you start to do is blend everything together. I mean, you have a system now. Now you can sort of like connect dots, right? And it becomes much easier to finish your occlusal and buckle reduction when you've sort of implemented these steps. So this is the occlusal view where I'm already 3 quarters through it. I'm already 3 quarters done. And I'll tell the patient, you know, after however many minutes this might could be 5 minutes, could be 10 minutes, depends on the patient, how many breaks they need, are they gagging, choking, all that stuff, right? So you do the best you can. You work as quickly and as efficiently as you can. And then I'll tell the patient where we are in the process because they want to be involved. They want to feel better. They want to know what's going on. So I'll say, hey, Mrs. Smith, we're three quarters of the way there. And they'll go, really? Because they never think it's that far along. And you go, yeah, we're almost done. Gives them a light at the end of the tunnel. This is all patient management stuff that, you know, you could talk about crown preps all day long, but it's the patient management stuff, it's relationship-based stuff that you do with your patients that's going to build your practice the most. So communicate with them, please. They, they want you to. A technique that I try and have used over the years now is I try and take that buckle and interproximal reduction as far to the lingual as I can see directly. I want to make my life as easy as possible when I get to that lingual reduction. Because unless I'm working on the upper where I can use my mirror and I'm doing OK with it, on the lower, I'm a righty. So on my right side, I don't see the lingual very well. And I will make the patient work for me, which you should all be doing too, by the way. Well, if, they need, if you need them to turn to the right, have them turn to the right. Like, have them move their heads. Don't make your life the only difficult one in the, in the, in the operatory, right? Let people help you. Patients will understand. They want you to, have, to give them the best result possible. And sometimes that means getting them involved. So have them move their head. So I take my reduction to the lingual as, as far as possible just to show you. And you can see it. It's right here. I mean, I, I can visualize. All I have left is like, I don't know, what's that, a third of the lingual? Maybe two thirds of the lingual? Mm -hmm.